My name is Christine Wallach. Um, I'm a trustee of the American Academy, and it's my very great pleasure uh, to welcome you to tonight's artist talk by Kevin Everson. He'll be giving the Ellen Maria Gerson lecture, which is made possible through the generosity of Nina von Malzahn, another member of our board of trustees, and one of the Academy's most active and generous benefactors. She's the granddaughter of Hans and Ludmilla Arnhold, in whose house here tonight's lecture is taking place. And without the support of the Kellen Arnhold family, the American Academy wouldn't exist as it does today. In fact, it wouldn't exist at all. Professor Everson currently teaches art and filmmaking at the University of Virginia, where he was recently awarded the Distinguished Teaching Professorship the university's most prestigious teaching award, and was the first African-American ever to receive this distinction. In researching for this introduction, I read some reviews by his students, and the conclusion <laughs> was, <laughs> he's not only a great professor, but he's a great human being, which is just a tremendous tribute. Um, in addition to being a great professor and a great human being, he's also a great filmmaker. Um, he's made numerous feature-length films and short films centered around themes of social justice, inspired by his African-American heritage and his upbringing in the working-class town of Mansfield, Ohio. His recent film, Tonsler Park, is emblematic of this, a documentary which films the democratic process in action in the African-American area surrounding Tonsler Park polling place in Charlottesville, a town in the United States which has been in the news for the wrong reasons uh, in the recent past, over the course of the election day, November 8th, 2016. Professor Everson's films and artwork have been showcased and celebrated around the globe in many prestigious venues, including the Sundance Film Festival in Venice, the Whitney Museum in New York, the National Gallery in Washington, the Tate Modern in London, and most recently here around the corner at the Berlinale, to name just a few. He was also the recipient in 2019 of a Heinz Award given to individuals who have made extraordinary contributions in the arts and the humanities. Very happy to have Kevin with us at the Academy and very eager to hear about his work. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to you. As always, we'll have time for questions after his talk, and then conversations can continue in the living room next door. Thank you, and over to you, Kevin. Well, uh, thanks for coming, and um, thanks for the, the uh, gracious and fine staff here at the American Academy of Berlin, and to my cool uh, peers who who um, who I eat with every day, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the golden goodness, whatever. But um, but anyway, so I'm just, so this talk's gonna be basically about um, about my work and practice, and then uh, mostly uh, mostly I'm gonna show about f five different approaches to how I uh, do film and art, and so to speak. Uh, but first, I got to give a little background. Um, yeah, I'm from this uh, small industrial town called Mansfield, Ohio. And um, at its height, it was like, I know, that's me in 1970 at Christmas. Uh, I had an aunt who used to work for the newspaper, and, uh, and she'd put me and my brother and cousins were in these, um, these, uh, these, these articles. But first of me, uh, but yeah, my hometown um, uh, was, um, I don't know if anybody know Ohio, but it's halfway in between Cleveland and Columbus. Um, most of the African Americans are predominantly from the South. Um, we used to call ourselves first generation Northerners. And then most of the white Americans were from Kentucky and Tennessee. So, uh, to always like the Malcolm X quote is that the uh, Mason Dixon line is the Canadian border. Because if you go outside major metropolitan you know, you know, kind of cities, it's very Southern, so to speak. So, that's in my hometown. But also, too, more importantly, like there was more jobs than people. It was mostly kind of industrial. Um, we had. Um, I used to work at a Weston house. We had a GM plant, Tappan, shoot, uh, Mansell Tire, Steel Mill, all these. And, and then since these places have closed down, and so to speak. But this image, I always had to show this like image too, because it was, came 
um, it was in the paper in 1970, uh, Christmas, and it was the same year the busing ruling had was uh, put down. So, I mean, was um, so was forced integration. So, actually, that white girl was not in my class. So it was these kind of happy, go lucky, like integration, like images, so to speak. But, um, but, <laughs> but of course, that Santa Claus is far more superior than that reef. So anyway, so I was making art back then. So, so anyway, so I was making art back in the day. But anyways, so I want to talk about my influences, and then I'm going to talk about the practice and how I got to actually making film from the other art. So I was a trained uh, photographer, sculptor, printmaker artist book and painter but then I got in the and I'm gonna talk about how I only got into films but a few artists uh, really kind of are what you're gonna see their examples in some of the work on the show so the one of the best artists this country ever produced was from Peoria Illinois was uh, Richard Pryor and so the whole idea of like his I mean he's a blue comic I guess you want to call it that is an actor uh, too as well and an activist so to speak and so I always like the way like his, like there were all these. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of art. My my mom was a bank teller. My dad was an auto mechanic. So, but they would get these records, um, and they didn't censor us. I mean, I'm like seven. Listen to like Richard Pryor, you know. And then, but because the reason why, because I think they knew it was high art. Well, they knew that this stuff is special, so to speak. So I was listening. So it was never like you thought I had to go into the next room or something like that. Um, it was just on, and we were just enjoying, like, the artistry of Richard Pryor. And, when, and, and one of my favorite pieces of artwork is this 10-minute uh, skit he does called Hank's Place, which he describes characters in his grandmother's brothel in Peoria, like Illinois. Brilliant piece of artwork. But anyway, so the like, thing I like about Pryor is that he would introduce a joke but talk about a minor character and give that minor character a one line that would kind of lead to a narrative. So, I mean, we have a 10-year-old here, so I'm going to keep it clean. But um, <laughs> a 10-year-old. So, but he has this, like, joke about cunnilingus. And so he say, so he has a, yeah. <laughs> A-A-B. <laughs> so anyway, so he has this, well, anyway, so he says he has this, so Pryor said he has this uncle that says, boy, whatever you do, don't do that. And Richard Pryor said, I can't wait to do that because my uncle has been wrong about everything in his life. <laughs> but, but we all know characters that you need that one description. So when you're making short films, poetry, or painting stuff, you know, these kind of formal devices are very important. So these are the kind of formal devices. This is a formal device that I do. So, I mean, that, that, just they're going to see these kind of minor characters that are playing major roles in these particular films. Um, another Illinois like artist, one of my favorite artists too, is Lorena Hansberry. Um, her play, Raising the Sun, and before I saw the actual production, I saw the Auto Primager 1959 film. Uh, based on the play, uh, with the same cast, I think, except for the little boy, I think. But anyway, uh, but anyway, I remember me and my brother were watching this film at, late at night, and for me, it was the kind of roller coaster of emotions that we're going through. How she can kind of like, um, kind of construct this kind of narrative. With like, you get her up one minute, down the next. It was pretty exhausting. So, but. I like it because that's a kind of Midwestern kind of thing is that, you know, the highs and lows are the same. So you want to keep that, that formal maintain of like nothing changes, so to speak. You want to keep it kind of there. So that's, um, so that's a formal device of um, uh, Lorena Hansberry. You can see some of the work. Um, two other artists, um, uh, Bootsy Collins and George Clinton. Uh, Bootsy Collins is actually from Ohio, Cincinnati. Uh, George Clinton's from Plainville, New Jersey. So they had these like Parliament Funkadelic albums growing up when I was growing up, like in the 70s. And then so I like the fact that they gave you the space to imagine as a young African American. So, I mean, George Clinton's got this great thing about the moon, said that we was already up there and we was waiting on y'all. So the fact that, <laughs> so the fact that, like, you know, you know, the fact that you know, that we were, you know, the fact that we were already up there, that, you know, that we were claiming this, this space too as well. So I've just, I'm going to show films of, that, that have at the moon too as well. But then the fact that, like, their albums were always about, like, underwater, space, but it was just kind of imagining. So it gave you this, gave me and gave us this kind of space where we can uh, kind of, like, imagine, so to speak. You know. So I'm going to show examples of, this, of my work based on this stuff as well. Um, two two painters are interested in me. Uh, Whitney Stanley um, is an abstract painter. He teaches at Tyler Temple. 
And in fact, I like kind of abstract expressionist paintings or abstract or new abstraction because it's a kind of this provisional way of making paintings, but also too, it's kind of self-referential, like it, because it's only within its own self, so to speak. Um, and the Caravaggio painting that I love too as well, there's always in his work, there's always somebody who is eyewitness in a certain event. So the whole ideal of it's in itself, it's kind of self-referential to as well, spatial, but also content to as well. So you're going to see some of that in the, like in the work. So I always think these two kind of paintings are very equivalent, kind of formally, so to speak. Yeah, um, yeah, and all, and also too, these other artists, uh, official and Vice, um, whatever they, um, they're Swiss artists. Vice passed away about. Oh, yeah, how many years ago? Three years ago. Three years ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so what they do is like, I have a kind of laser pointer here, but but they, um, uh, but, but this is at the Wexner Center in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And, and, and so what they do is they make objects that are mundane. Like these are poly, like everything in this room is polyurethane but painted, so to speak. So they make the things that you ignore. Like I've been to official and vice show where in the old, um, Soho galleries where you take the elevator up to the show and then people would ignore it because you see uh, ladders, paint bottles, but those were the objects that they would make. This way, they would make the things that were part of the show change, so to speak. And so just what I like about it is just the little formal details. It's almost like, so you see, like, to have this thing painted green here gives it this backstory. Give it a really subtle backstory, you know, saying that, like, this thing has been used. So these, like, short, like, formal devices, um, for me, kind of drives a kind of a narrative, so to speak, yeah. You know, the way that how, how, how you can see the thing. And for me as an artist, and uh, then you, I'm going to talk about reenactments, too, as well, but how you would see a person there and model the work behind, you know. So there's always the, with the object... Uh, what the person or, or the thing, but also what you create, what, what, you know, like you kind of use it as a model, so to speak. So um, I know there's a kind of practice of found footage and found objects, but I like to make the thing because then you know more intellectually about the thing formally and also um, conceptually too as well. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about this. And, and this is, I don't know if he's from Detroit, but uh, what... But but this Davos, he has this like um, on Grand River Road. Grand River, God, what's the street? Grand River what? Anybody from Detroit? Uh, the street is Grand River Way or? Go oh, Grand River, yeah. So he has a kind of a block long exhibition, so to speak, of a kind of a living sculpture. So he painted these houses and things like that. So I took this picture. Um, so I actually walked around and got right here where I like this formal device where the stumps look like cans and the cans look like stumps. And for me, uh, I'm going to show film clips, but that's the, the kind of film editing that I like to do. I like to have this kind of formal qualities, but more kind of conceptual cutting to each scene to films. Uh, so, uh, so to speak, whatever. So I like these objects kind of close together for, for me because it's like a film edit. It's like a film cut. Um, but again, I, you know, I was talking about that, I, like I was a trained, um, like my degrees are in fine art photography and I'm a street photographer, or was, I gotta say I'm a filmmaker now, but you know, depends on what arena I'm in <laughs> pretty much. But, but anyway, but you know, like street photography, like, um, like uh, Roy de Carver, uh, Gary Winogram, and Robert Frank, and August Sanders, the great German photographer. And then so, and so for years, I used this particular camera called a Wide Lux camera. And it was basically takes 35 millimeter film. Instead of 35 frames, you, you get 21 long frames. And it's basically, I mean, it has three shutter speeds, a 15th of a second, you know, 1 125th, and 250. And it basically, like, the film is in here, and then, and then so the lens moves around the film. So it creates this kind of effect, whatever. So, yeah, and, and then so the event over here constantly occurs before the event over here. Because it basically takes, like, 39 or 37, like, the little pictures. And then so for me, it was always this constant verb. So, it's, again, it was getting toward, like, I didn't know at the time, but I was getting toward cinema, so, you know, film, so to speak. So, anyways, so, like, the, the you know, stuff I was framing up or trying to compose was, I was trying to compose 
uh, like, of course, African Americans posing or performing what objects and elements are representation. So I always see somebody taking a picture or painting signs. Uh, but also, too, I was trying to find the snapshot um, that was part of African American tradition and also the fine art photography in the same frame. And also the camera had a 19 millimeter lens, so I could basically tap her on her back, like, 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 like I said, to get somebody to turn around or, or, or actually look into the frame, so to speak. So I have a couple examples of these. Um, Columbia, South Carolina. So I saw this kid walking out with it, the drum or something like that. So the whole idea of kind of this artistic practice or the potential for artistic practice. Um, this was like a, like a city council meeting in Knoxville, Tennessee. So the whole idea of what the orator or whatever. And you can see the blurriness through the 15th of a second with an interior exposure. Um, uh, yeah, and then as I started to photograph more, um, I became more aggressive with the framing, like the like the uh, characters or the, the subject matters would be more kind of cropped off, like, like so to speak. And then the idea of like mixtapes and kind of making your own art, you know, expression, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, at the same time, um, you know, I like again, I studied multiple art forms and art mediums, and then so I was doing like sculpture and making furniture. Um, and in this um, body of work. Uh, was instrumental into me making films because because I made like multiple of these things, and it was basically at the time like the mid nineties I was making artwork that was presenting so called art in the African the working class African American home. So I would make the end table that would present the frame picture. So and it was based on I don't know my parents furniture, but also Dutch modernism I guess. And my thing was that um, and in these photographs. Where it did, and then so I was making work about uh, black migration. So the one, so the small, uh, like the photographs, was like a school book picture from 1950s when my mom was in high school. And these are uh, prison guards uh, who I went to school with. So at the time, um, the factory started closing. I remember um, I graduated high school in 83. My brother graduated in 81, and his friends got jobs at the factories. And by the time I got out, the jobs were no longer there. Um, and then, so we always had a state penitentiary in my hometown, the Ohio State Reformatory. And now it's a film set. You may see, um, what the hell is, um, Shawshank Redemption. It was all shot there. Uh, my favorite movie, um, uh, uh, Air Force One. You ever see that thing? Like the Soviet gulag was, uh, was actually a thing because, um, <laughs> yeah, like Harrison Ford on the play is like, it's unbelievably great. Or whatever, but um, but that prison has a six-story cell block. It's the highest cell block in the Western Hemisphere, and also too, um, those were the only jobs you can get at the time. So it was basically the catch-23, not even the 22, was the more crime in Cleveland, Cincinnati, Toledo, Akron, and Columbus, the more my friends had jobs. So we were rooting for crime, you know. So they're just kind of weird. So they, so you're just locking up. So another kind of um, potential warehousing, so to speak, was going on. So anyway, so these were images of like uh, prison guards, but there's another one too as well. Um, and but what I was just while I was making these things, I was explaining to like, people who were coming by and looking at them, and then and, and then so my whole thing was about the economy of these things, where like. Well, growing up, everybody would shop at Bing's Furniture. It was uh, Bing's Furniture. I can't, I, I, I can't believe I remember that. But anyway, but everybody had the same stuff. So everybody had the same furniture because we all shopped in the same, you know. So I go to my friend's house. I knew everything was because we had the same kind of stuff. And, you know, I would go look. Oh, never mind. I get it. But, um, but then also, too, but then my whole thing is just like, I like the fact that a person would work all week, get paid on Friday, go to Bing's Furniture on fr Saturday and buy an end table and put it in their home. So I was thinking more time-based. So I like sculpture. I like the idea of walking around sculpture and the kind of three-dimensional alley of it stuff. But I was thinking more of the duration because I always would remember, and then I think I told some of the fellows here, is that you know my parents would look different on Friday than they did on Monday because <laughs> they had the week of work on them. 
they were, phys- you know, like the physical labor, like, you know, it would just be like, you know, because my mom would cook all the time except for Friday because she would work late at the bank and my dad worked late. So it was the only times that they didn't cook because I could just tell. So I wanted to show the kind of physicality of what labor does to the body, so to speak. So how the body changes, how how the physicality like of it. And, then, and so I thought the best way of doing that was using more time-based a medium. So I think can we control the lights or something? I'm gonna I'm gonna show some clips of some stuff and actually better with the lights off. I think as well to get pictures. So anyway, so this is a film uh, like I'm gonna show this is a 30 minute film called Company Line. So I'm gonna show maybe first two, three minutes of it. And it's basically uh I did a, like a trillion of films about the first three black neighborhoods in my hometown. And one of them was called the camps. They worked at the uh, steel mill. Uh, one of them was called Watch Works where they were domestic workers. And Company Line, where they worked at the steel mill, too, as well. And in the neighborhood, the Company Line is no longer there anymore. So to, to get to tell the story, I had uh, I was interviewing all these snowplow truck drivers. And I think the United States is when we have a lot of snow. And actually, there is a, the, that, like, well, there is a big disaster economy in the United States. And the people are hurting right now in the Midwest because we're not getting any snow. And it's, you know, so anyway, so, so, so people will push and move and plow snow. So I was trying to get to tell the story of the company line of these streets through these um, uh, city workers who shoveled to push snow, but also to get their narrative of where they're, and then where they're, and where they're from. So just like the end tables, is all about the kind of black migration. So where, they're, uh, so where they come from and what kind of jobs they had, so to speak. So I'm gonna show you a clip of the company line. And this, oh, and the, and the materials are mini DV, 16 millimeter, and still photography. So I like to combine multiple materials. And now I'm, I'm top off to about 30,000 a year. Because I, uh, I got my 16 years in, all of that. And that's it. But the starting rate is, what, $7 something an hour for a new high end? Starting out? Yeah. That's all they have to see the man and like say, hold it. Man. Oh, this record. Born and raised in Columbia, Mississippi, all of that. And um, moved up here in 1981, just to visit. Stayed about four or five years. Went home, came back, uh, got a job at Tapping for about, I think I worked at Tapping about eight years. Left Tapping, went back home again. <laughs> then I came up this time and uh, it came up after that. Then I started working season for the city. I worked out, I did season for the city about five years, and after that, I got a full-time job in 1992. And now I got 16 years in with the city. Yeah, so like, so like in the film, there's multiple like interviews with all these, with the with a person who's to live in the company line, but also stories told by the snowplow truck, you know, like like drivers, so what kind of jobs they had and stuff like that. So just kind of telling that kind of narrative. Um, this other film, and again, I come from like kind of sculpture and photography. This other this clip I'm going to show here is from this film called Eerie, which is basically a, a film that has, um, I know some people went to the to uh, the Arsenal last week to see a film I did called Recovery that was a full 10-minute reel of a magazine um, so this film is not eight, ten minute takes, long takes without any editing. Uh, and it's for me, it's the more the kind of materiality of the film, the sculptural of the film. It's just where like the cameras are, part, you know. So I, you know, my professors were from like the '70s who were all about materials, process, and procedure in art. So I, so for me, the materials are part of the content. Of what, the, of what the film or the sculpture or whatever it is. So, so then so I was making this film that was 10-minute takes, and it was, 
uh, they, yeah, uh, eight, ten minute takes. And it's about the kind of black migration from the south to the north. And it's all about the auto industry. And this still is based on this guy that I walked upon that he was trying to break into his own car because he locked his keys in the car. So I was filming him for 10 minutes. I was hoping he wouldn't get his keys out by the time the film was up. But, uh, yeah. so, you know. but anyway, so anyway. But, but anyway, so the clip I'm going to show with you, and then for me it's like that Dabbles uh, sculpture about the, the, the stumps and the paint cans. So the clip I'm going to show is that my cousins, and actually the guy that was driving that uh, car, was a, uh, the snowplow truck was, was a cousin of mine too as well. So my cousins, they, two of them, with the twins that just reached Sadie and Daisy, they had just retired from GM that Friday when I filmed this, and my cousin Ad was still working there. So this is one of the first times you hear people talking about working in the General Motors factories. But for me, just when I was writing and designing the film, I was thinking about one scene that was going to come after that. And so I would show, so I'll show like a minute of the end of one take, and the, you know, a few seconds of the beginning of with the next take. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I actually talked to a guy uh, Friday. And him and I was standing there talking, and he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm, I'm retiring. He said, good for you. He said, because I have 15 years. I can't go nowhere. Right. I can't retire. I can't take the grow into. I can't take the mutual. He said, I am stuck. And he said, am I angry? Yes, I am angry because I'm losing big time. You know, he said, I can't do anything. I got to stay here until this plant closed. Yeah, and then I understand that with him. I sympathize for him, too. But, you know, even with my situation, I'm missing the mutual by four months. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, I'm not angry about it. I'm willing to, to, to go somewhere else, wherever they want to send me right now. You know, I, I, I'm in the home stretch. Mm -hmm. I got 23 years, seven more years I can retire. So mm -hmm. it's... It would be ludicrous for me to give up 23 years for $115,000. Yeah. It's not going to do me any good. And, and then that one guy, he missing about six days. Right. Oh, yeah. Six so days. It's and different six for days. everybody's situation. Right. Yeah. Everybody, have a, everybody got a story. Everybody right. have a different situation. And, and then, of course, you know? the real ends. And, and, it's, and it's, then so the next sad. shot comes. And so I was thinking about this film. I was thinking about, you know, the whole idea of since the viewer has to sit there for 10 minutes and watch something without any cuts so I wanted the, the subject matter to be internal well, again like the abstract paintings it's self referential so I wanted the subject matter in the film to concentrate on something for 10 minutes so I was thinking and so like, like the one to write in the film I was thinking like the best thing could could be sword fighting I don't know it didn't make sense to me <laughs> because like I wanted these actors to do this uh, so I remember we hired a fight coach and, and these guys were actors and then so the guy was so the, the fight coach was saying so what kind of swords you want them to use and I said the loudest because because the swords are made by hand and so every time I see a General Motors car I think of my cousin uh, Sadie and Daisy and Ad because they are working on cars all the you know so every time I see General Motors cars I think my cousin's hands has been on those cars so I wanted something that was handmade so to speak to kind of make the audio so so for me that's like the stumps and the paint cans, the kind of formal and conceptual bridge from one shot to the uh, next. And this next, uh, I'm going to show a little, I'm not going to show all this film. It's, it's eight hours long. It's called Park Lanes. And it's basically um, a full day in a factory. And in this factory, they make bowling alley supplies. And for me, and then again, it plays in the theater. And so I want people to kind of not, they don't have to sit there um, for the whole thing. But, um, but the fact that um, but I wanted to kind of see if I could physically make something eight hours so ahead. So one of my favorite artists is a guy named Lob Diaz, a Filipino filmmaker. Um, I remember he got these nine-hour narrative films. So if it takes 24 minutes for the cart and the ox to come up the road, it takes 24 minutes for the cart and the ox to come up the road. So, but then the whole idea of you become invested in the people. The longer you stay without the cuts, because once you edit something, you're telling somebody what to think. So, but once you leave something unedited, you're letting somebody, and you, you're letting the subject matter breathe on the, the audience, so to speak. And then, like, uh, another thing, I, I don't really care much about the audience, because uh, I make films for the subject matter and me. So then the whole idea of, like, showing these particular things. So, so, so basically, Park Lane, let me turn it down. So then I was hoping to find a big ticket item because I used to make washers and dryers. So I wanted to maybe start from one, from, from like a small thing to the big ticket item. But uh, um, 
but we couldn't find that uh, factory that would let us in. And hopefully, I can shoot in a Volkswagen factory uh, before I leave here. But this is, um, but so so this was they make bowl ounce supplies. So I was trying to find a, like a narrative. So we're shooting for three days, three cameras, and so I just basically film things that look like sculpture objects, like so these kind of abstract things. So. So again, like a lot of my films, again, I'm, I'm always I keep saying this word self-referential, because I like for the fact that people on screen are smarter than the audience. Because even when you see those General Motors folks who were talking, they were speaking General Motors ease. So unless you don't work in there, so for me it's fascinating to hear how people talk about their own career. You know, so like fact that you, like the audience has to keep up. Yeah, you know, so to speak. So, so like intellectualism is on screen instead of like in with the like audience, so to speak. Yeah. So, so I and then in Park Lanes, I think the longest shot is lunch. It's 33 minutes. Um, there's some 17, some a minute, you know, some 10. Like it depends on what the task is. Um, so to speak. Uh, I don't know what's happening after this. Yeah. So anyway, so then I started focusing. You know, first I had a narrator that was going through the film, but then I decided to like just kind of use, just have the objects maybe look more like kind of like sculptural, like objects in speech. Yeah, yeah. So, park lane. Oh, shoot, I forgot I have a clicker. Oh yeah, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. So in like, here's another uh, single take film. Uh, this film's called Ta like the Town of the Park. I shot it uh, the whole day of the 2016 election. And what I was going for was basically, again, this is the Richard Pryor deal. These are the minor characters. Uh, these are people who are keeping democracy alive. These are people that you don't notice. This when you, it's just when you give your, just when you give their name, you give, just give your name and you go vote and then, and then you leave. So I remember going, actually, four years ago to the day, I biked late to the primary because it's Super Tuesday to a day in the States. And so I just remember going there and seeing all these African Americans, like, to work in there thinking I could make a 13-hour film because the polls are open for 13 hours. I said, like, no, it's crazy, but not that crazy. But anyway, so, but then so I thought I could just make 10-minute 10, uh, 10 takes of, you know, portraits of uh, civil servants who are keeping democracy alive. And for me, um, it's more, it's, you know, of course that's the kind of thing, but for me it's the formal qualities. So for me, it's almost like an experimental flicker film because I wanted to use telephoto lenses. And then again, I make films like a painter. Like I, you know, like I said, the easel, the paint and the paint brushes, I have the tripod, the camera, and the lenses in the film stock. And for me, it was all about using this telephoto lens and to have the subject matter kind of go in and out. So you see all the kind of like, like kind of kind of the people blocking our subject matter, and then the, and the, and then so with the subject changes, you know, like so to speak. And my strategy is that just when I kind of put together these films, like the subject matter does not need you. So when you shoot a documentary and all that, and the way you edit it, so to speak, you know, it has to be consumed by the subject matter. And for me, the subject matter here doesn't need the viewer because they're going to be doing what they'd be doing, you know, doing anyway, so to speak. And then, so that was the kind of strategy of, uh, you know, consular part, whatever. And it was nice, too, because we didn't, and I'm using this camera that's not a crystal sync sound-like camera. And then, so we couldn't film the sound on them because they're giving out names and addresses. So the sound is coming from the um, atmosphere of, with the room, and I'm just, like, putting it together. So it's not a legal document of what the sound is there, but it is an object. It's, it is more of an art object than a so-called legal document. Sure. Yeah, and then also too, um, again, making a film about civil service. Uh, uh, with, this is a, a still, a film called Sandfield, and then it's based on some of the films I showed here, uh, the film showed last week. Um, but, but this was shot on the uh, Air Force Base in Columbus, Mississippi, and it's basically employees of the um, with civilians and soldiers who are airmen at the um, Air Force Base. Um, yeah, and then also too, you know, um, those films are more about labor, but this film here is more about leisure. And for me, it's about intellectualizing uh, something that people don't really see that much. And then this film is based on uh, calf roping. And then I shot this film in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, at a black a rodeo. Met a family. I met a couple of families who are from Natchez, Mrs. Uh, sippy, so I just film these people practicing uh, like uh, calf, uh, like roping. And for me, 
Um, the thing I like about this is that I like, and then I have a lot of these friends. I gave Curl a link to this film called Cinnamon and Anthony, which is about uh, African Americans uh, who are drag racing. And I like the fact that people are doing these kind of sports and events who are more, um, who who understand what they're doing. They're intellectualizing what they're doing. So what, they make these obstacles. So here it's kind of like that last wide lux image I showed where where all the chaos is happening outside the frame. There's people talking and so and then so they're using these obstacles, some they buy and some they make, uh, to kind of practice their craft. So be so these people are like they're the students and they're city workers, so they'll come home and they'll practice calf roping. And for me I always thought I was privileged being in the arts. But uh, you know my dad you know my dad you know, I don't think he graduated high school, but he became the foremost Volvo mechanic in, in the Midwest. And for me, through practice and repetition, you become good at something. So for me, it's like a dancer or a poet or like an artist. You become good at something. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's still. Uh, but anyway, so that's a scene from uh, uh, this. Yeah. And so these are the stills I'm going to show. So I also have a body of work where I'm re-representing people from Mansfield and famous uh, events that happen in my hometown, um, and then Alleg and then uh, Mansfield sits on the Allegheny Plateau, so I just found a plateau and you know whatever. <laughs> so with it, with it, with this film's called Ears, Nose, and Throat. Um, it's about a like murder that happened in my hometown, and the film again is like the kind of Carvajal. She was the, she, she was on trial. I mean, she was the like the person per in jail. She was the eyewitness. I witnessed the event. So um, I had my daughter, a year, uh, a year ago, my daughter was doing a, like an ear test. And so I thought that was like kind of swearing in. So then I just kind of shot her, giving her testimony um, as she was getting an examination, uh, like ears, nose, and throat. Um, IFO, um, identify flying, like objects, like one of the most cre credible UFO sightings in the history of the United States is over my hometown. Um, these... National Guard airmen flew their helicopter and like chased this cigar-shaped object, and the reason why people believe them because they said that they're um, because they use they use so much fuel, kind of like ascending. But my uncles, you know, be like, man, them white guys are crazy. Probably flew to Indianapolis, picked up hookers, so they don't believe them, you know. So, so like, so in this film, there is the recount of the Queen, like, like the incident, but also there's this African American cab driver who was saying that he saw a flying saucer. And then the third incident in the film is these triangle sculpture things I made that me and my dad saw these three triangles like in the sky, like in the 70s. Um, uh, Richland Blue, I've been making films about films made in my hometown. Uh, those of you in the United States and probably my age who got driver's license saw these films called Signal 30. Um, they're just like brutal films where people were in these car wrecks and the police would film them. But anyway, these uh, my hometown had these really corrupt police officers, and they made uh, stag films, and they made a film where they arrested an African American woman for shoplifting and made her star in her own PSA about shoplifting. So I just kind of, without seeing these films, because I can't get a hold of them, but heard about them, I kind of reenacted these films in Richland Blue. Um, round seven is based on this uh, boxer from my hometown named Art McKnight. He was one of the first fighters to fight, well, actually the first African-American fighter to fight uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. And um, he lost controversially. So um, we had uh, Art McKnight do the voiceover, and then, I, uh, then we had a Golden Glove boxer kind of reenact it. And then my sound person was like, uh, was the Hicks, um, she was... Um, she was playing the ring girl, but she held the signs like a protest, you know, like, so to speak. So it was around seven. Um, there was a famous gospel album recorded in my hometown, um, Traveling Shoes uh, by the Brown Singers. I made a film based on that. Um, oh, yeah. And then also, too, um, I still make props and sculptures that are part of the films I uh, do. Um, so I started making props. Um, this is a film called Six Position. It's about uh, I used to live next to a funeral home, and uh, and then so they have these funeral headrests. So I designed a, like a headrest based on I think a South African headrest, like I think so to speak. So a film called Six Positions. Um, so so that's a sculptural like object. 
Um, the, the film that you saw the clip was eerie. The first shot of that film is uh, it's based on these. Um, I have these uh, billboard people hang up these uh, this billboard that I made. That is a fictional billboard. Um, that's my uncle posing next to a, a Volkswagen when he was stationed here in, in West Germany. And so we just, he looked like a jazz singer and he's cool as hell. So we just made this billboard, which was up in Angola, New York for three weeks. And nobody said anything. But so, and then you see it's what, what, what John just displayed in the gallery. But anyway, so with these are, uh, oh yeah, um, it's based on billboards that they used to put down in, in the South to advertise jobs for African Americans that come up north. Um, this is a film called FE26. Um, I used to live in Cleveland. Um, they used to call it Thieveland. Uh, is it still anything? Um, I remember somebody stole my car, my maps in my car, um, paper maps. I was I was more upset than anything. You know, I'm stuck in Pennsylvania without maps. But anyway, um, and, and that's nowhere. Nobody wants to be stuck. But anyway, so the film is based on a manhole. Uh, you know, you know, folks stealing uh, copper pipes and manhole like the covers. So I made the tools for this. Um. um a film called Sound That, which, uh, which, which is based on the water department in Cleveland, and then they use these aquaphones to hear leaks. So I made an aquaphone. Um, all right. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the Island of St. Uh, Matthews is shot in Columbus, Mississippi. Um, I, you know, I, like, I always ask my, my family from Columbus, Mississippi, and so I asked my aunt, um, where are all the old pictures? Because I want to make all these kind of art objects with the old photographs on my mom's side. And she was saying, oh, we lost them in the flood of 1973 of the Tom Bigby like river. So I made a film based on the flood. And then my grandfather started the St. Matthew's Church in the early uh, 20th century. So they couldn't get to the bell. So I made a bell for the church, uh, bronze, like out of bronze. Um, now I'm making sculptures that, so in the past I'd make things for the films that work. Now I'm making things out of rubber that don't work. So this is Cardinal, Brown, Thatcher, and Mockingbird. Um, they're basically the state birds of Ohio, Georgia, and Mississippi. So I'm making these uh, kind of, uh, oh, and, the, and what the binoculars are, were made from the Westinghouse factory where I used to work at. Um, in the, I worked there in the 80s, but these were for the World War II effort, uh, the binoculars. So I just buy them on eBay and cast them, uh, so to speak. Um, <laughs> And then also, uh, the, the Western Half Factory actually made iron. So I made these like irons that don't work, that are rubber, and film, um, uh, you know, and film like folks trying to iron with, with, with these, with, 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 with these rubbers, with irons, whatever. Um, yeah. And then also too, I have a, a body of work um, that's based on archival uh, film footage. So I got a lot of. Uh, for years, I was trying to make archival, uh, like. Uh, I was trying to find a lot of found footage because, like in the experimental film world, there's a practice of found footage. And then you couldn't find anything of African Americans at first, or at least I couldn't, because um, nobody aimed cameras at African Americans. Like all the TV ads, cigarette ads, are all had white people in them, or white Americans in them. And then, so I started finding stuff. And then I actually started shooting films that looked like uh, archival footage as well. Um, but I mostly were getting stuff from news uh, footage. So this, um, like, I'm going to show this, this film called Emergency Needs. And I got commissioned by the Rotterdam Film Festival to make a film based on Gus Van Sant, the American filmmaker. And I was like, Man, I don't know anything about Gus, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, and then, <laughs> and then so I thought, oh, well, he has three films called uh, one, Jerry, Last Days, and Elephant where one of them is about the Columbine shooting, the other one is about this guy in the desert kills his friend so he wouldn't have to go through you know, suffering in the desert, and the other one was about Kurt Cobain. So there were about three events that people know what happened, but don't know what happened. And so I was thinking, of what event do I know about that? And then I remember there was a, an uprising in Cleveland called the uh, Glen, no, the Cleveland Shootout, a.k.a. the Glenville Uprising. And in, in it was basically... Um, was well, the only uprising in the United States where more blacks, no, where more police were killed than blacks. And the police were driving around trying to get the numbers up. They were indiscriminately shooting people on, on the east side of town. And it was basically based, like, in 1967, Cleveland had these uprisings called the Huff Uprising. And then on the strength of the Huff Uprising, uh, Carl B. Stokes 
was elected mayor. He was the first African American to be to be elected mayor of a major metropolitan city. So Cleveland was one of the only cities that didn't burn down when Martin Luther King was murdered. But later that summer it was a Cleveland shootout, aka the Glenville uprising. So here, so so I had all this footage from um, uh, from the press conferences, and I wanted to call attention to Mayor Stokes's performance. So I had an actor play Mayor Stokes as well. So you're going to see what I did, yeah. However, I'm going to show the first two or three minutes. Concerned. I base this on conferences all day here at City Hall and out in the city with National Guard officers, police officials, city councilmen, representatives of the Negro community, Actually, and my camera other died people. there, so, but we use it anyway. As I make this judgment, I wish to pay tribute to both... So this is show like a, just another minute or so. So I was doing this so you would not pay attention to the content or something. I, don't know. I believe that the crisis has passed. However, there is still cause to be concerned. Now, I base this on conferences all day here at City Hall and out in the city with National Guard officers, police officials, city councilmen, representatives of the Negro community, and other people. As I make this judgment, I wish to pay tribute to both the great desire of the Negro community that order be restored and the ability and effectiveness of the Cleveland police and National Guardsmen operating under trying and somewhat unique circumstances. That's, of course, called be We must, however, remain prepared to meet special circumstances that could arise following this period of high tension. A lot of white people, a lot of whites in the nation as well as in Cleveland seem to feel that if you were elected mayor, there would be no racial violence in Cleveland. What do you think that this has done to that image? Well, there always always has been a very very great great difficulty. difficulty. In, in helping, helping people, people to understand, understand what, what have been, have been and ordinarily and are ordinarily are the, the uh, basic causes, basic of, causes riots. of riots. Ordinarily, ordinarily the, the rioting, rioting as we have known it, the civil disorders as we have known it, has been the frustrated, frustrated rebellion, rebellion or reaction, reaction of, a, uh, of, a, uh, of a deprived population, of a deprived population to an unresponsive to city, an government, unresponsive city government. Now, that was now, not reflected, in, was last not reflected in last night's incident. incident. And, it would, and it would have to be, to be at, least at least at this point, point last, last night's, night's incident, incident would still have to be viewed in the light of the, uh, of the, uh, of the small, small and determined, and group, determined group, that group that were involved. What were they determined in doing? I mean, what was their motive, folks? What did they want to do? Well, I can't well, guess at their, their, their motive, but we can only draw the conclusion from the... The fact that they were the armed and uh, were they unhappy about something? The fact that they were they armed were. and uh, do you have any idea what they were unhappy about? Well, well nothing that I could report to you at all. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that's uh, yes. Anyway, so that's so it feels like seven minutes, but then like every now and then there's a both of them are talking together. Some things. So for me, it's all about exercise. You know, like his. You know, he's pre-Obama before Obama, right? He's like, cool. And then, and then this white press is super hostile to him. But I wanted to call a question to his performance. That's why I hired, I hired an actress who didn't look like him. And then also, too, um, well, an actor it didn't look like him. But, and then so, but also, too, I wanted to see if I could strip down content by going through pure form and then using that as a gesture, so to speak. But on the strength of, like, kind of reenacting found footage, um, I have a colleague, probably the smartest person on campus, uh, Professor Claudrina Harold, and she was doing research on the history of African Americans at the University of Virginia. And so we had this, and she has this class called Black Fire about, you know, like the protests and stuff, and the, black, the history of black students at the University of Virginia. So we've been doing these kind of reenactments of... Um, of the events, these kind of special events that like to happen at the University of VA. And, uh, and I'm just going to show, um, so what this is uh, Vivian Gordon, who started um, the African American Studies program. That's actually my old colleague who passed away a couple years ago, like Julian Bond here, um, like on the right. 
And then, so we found all these kind of old photographs, and she thought that she found all these film stocks. So somebody shot a documentary, but it was just films that weren't returned to you know various libraries. And this photograph was found in, in the archives as well. It is the only photograph since 1839 of African Americans playing foosball. Um, so you know, I love this photograph. So and then so we made this film called uh, Sugar Coated Arsenic, which is uh, Vivian Gordon's voice being over and. This is an actress. Um, this is the cocktail scene photograph you saw, and with that's uh, Aaron Stewart. He was in. She's been in several other of my films, and so she plays Vivian Gordon. So this is a silent part of the footage, and oh shoot! And this is uh, the reenactment of the foosball scene that you saw, like you know, like cause what the uh, photograph that well in that film, uh, the photograph we saw found in the archives, and. Um, uh, yeah, and then so we made multiple films. Uh, this film's called We the Man. Um, James Roebuck was the first African American PhD student. Um, he's actually a Congress, a state rep in uh, from from Philadelphia, and it was basically they wrote a note to the to the Senate to protest the Vietnam War. So we made this as if somebody found a bio part of a biopic, like should go to arsenic as if somebody found a documentary based on African Americans, and uh, this film is about the first college chip like athletes. Uh, Kent Merritt was doing the narrative. He was a football player. Um, this is, uh, the African American students picked up Sly and the Family Stone from the airport, so we, re so we reenacted. Of course, we cast by hairstyles. You know, it's, it's so much easier. But And then also, too, there was an area on the, the campus called the Black Bus Stop, so we made this magical realism dance thing based on the Black Bus Stop. And this is about the black gospel choir called Black Voices in the University of Virginia. Um, yeah, so I have another body of work about projections. And so I actually make projections for galleries and museums and stuff like that. So when I do that, um, they're mostly, well, first let me show, uh, show so some, yeah. So this is a film. I uh, rigged up my 16 millimeter camera to the University of Virginia telescope. So I filmed the moon. So at one point, the gallery gets dark, and the other part, the gallery gets light, because it's a 10-minute take of, like, from moon to space and back to space to moon. Um, then also, I've been an eclipse junkie. Uh, I've been following the eclipse stuff and filming those, and then the way, the, like, the subject matter affects the uh, gallery space. And also, too, I've been crushing General Motors cars, um, because the, the plant in my hometown was a stamping plant, and um, and then so every time I go somewhere, I see if I can get cars crushed, you know, so to speak. And so that's so that's so I'm gonna let this film play. Uh, uh, this film, I think it should be playing. Uh, hold on here, uh, so I can actually take questions and let this film play. So this film's called like uh, nine, uh, like the '93. Uh, my daughter's great, uh, late great grandfather. James uh, Williams blows out 93 candles. So he, so he makes the gallery dark. Uh, so again, the subject matter of, so it just, when I film, make films for installations, um, or more for an active audience, for people to kind of move in and out of a gallery, I always have the subject matter affect the way the gallery looks, so to speak. So, so anyway, so that's a, uh, I can pick questions, and I think I'm maybe a little bit over time, but, um, yeah, anybody got any comments, questions? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, man. 50 minutes. 50 minutes, yeah. So, um, any comments? Yes, sir, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, toward the beginning about a uh, teacher you had that uh, was all about process or materials, process, and procedure. Proceed yeah, yeah, Can yeah. Can you yeah. spell that out a little? Could I beg your pardon? What was that? Yeah. Could you spell that out? Yeah, or? yeah. I mean, it's basically like how, like, what the minimalist art would, like, you know, exhibit how they were made, so to speak. Um, um, like, the Sierra sculptures, like, you know, Sierra sculptures, I would have all the markings on it, uh, like the cut plate, you know, where it was cut, you know. So how the work was made is part of the content, so to speak, yeah. Yeah. So I like, so for me with the materials, like I'm not trying to fool anybody. Like these things are made with these particular, what, um, no, what materials. Yeah. 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 Did I answer your question? Did, did, so. Yeah. Um, no, 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 I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Anybody? anybody? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, just extraordinary stuff. Just, to, just, uh, yeah. just uh, blew, that... blew us off the map here. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to uh, get to uh, a point you made uh, early on about um, about editing, and you yeah, said yeah, that yeah. how how you edit in effect uh, interprets it cuts uh, when you when you uh, change shots. Yeah. And so um, again, you know, you think of uh, of, of, of film theory and the and and the uh, those who in fact are uh, are uh, champions of the long take. Yeah, and again, yeah, I go yeah. back to Bazin, who in effect was on the yeah, great. Totally, yeah. So again, uh, uh, are you? Uh, how do you? How do you think the long take uh, uh, in your in your work? Um, yeah, I mean, I just like. Um, for me, it's the witnessing of something. Right, and then so it's the I within the yeah. Just I mean, there's yeah. no trick handles. It's, it's just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just like yeah, yeah. And then for uh, me, I think the longer you sit with something, the more you become invested yeah. into the subject matter, so to yeah. speak. I can, yeah. just, I can just say anecdotally, uh, in, in teaching uh, uh, cinema at, at Harvard, I, I sit in the projection booth with Clayton Matos, and uh, and then we look at these students. And when a, uh, a film, a classical film comes on, all you start to see the flashing of uh, cell phones. Because yeah. They can't, stand, they, can't, <laughs> they can't go for more than three seconds. I mean, it's not even time. kids. It's like adults, too, you know, exactly. like adults. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, who teaches them, right, you know? I mean, they don't learn on their own. But, I mean, for me, you know, I like the fact that, well, and then for uh, me, I think, like, sometimes, I mean, I make, Films that aren't just a long take, and sometimes yeah, you need sure. the cuts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then it's interesting, it's going to be, a, I don't know how long the answer, but, but anyway, the stuff that me and Claudrina make, um, like, there's an invitation for a viewership for them. I have to, because making them for black alumni and the black students, and so I know, like, the first shots and the first like cuts have to be this invitation. Just when I'm making the long takes myself, there's no invitation. I was like, because uh, like, you, you, you're in the middle of Act Two. Um, for me, the long take is like, because there's no Act One, there's no setup, and there's no conclusion. It's just like it just it like it just is. So for me, it's like kind of a pull abstraction from that, so to speak. So then the viewer has to kind of, you know, for me, like that's how I kind of uh, do uh, or look at the long take is that. Like this happened before you got there, and it'll happen after you, like after the viewer leaves, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Anybody else? Uh, no. I have a question. What location yeah. are you filming? Are they shown only at galleries or sometimes at cinemas? So you mentioned you have been at the Berlinale. Yeah, well, Uli made a mistake of showing the film of mine last week <laughs> uh, at, at, at the Bernan Bern Alley, whatever. Um, yeah, galleries, museums. Uh, film festivals and art houses, so to speak. Um, I have a bunch of films playing. Where's Uli at? Uh, 20, April 28th, 9th, and 30th? Yeah. Yeah, at the Arsenal. So there's like two features and three programs of shorts. So, yeah, so that kind of, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Yes, yeah, I think, yeah, it, yes, woman. <laughs> nah, not really. Um, for me, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, it's mostly like visual art that kind of gets me going. Like I know nothing about film, no, it's, you know. Um, but for me, it's more like it just when I get inspired by something. Like it's mostly by visual arts. It's not by cinema. I mean, I grew up on like monster movies, Godzilla films. Love those because I like a guy in a suit just stomping around stuff because it's three dimensional. Like, but because as opposed to a green screen, and and so I like that and. I don't know, black exportation films. I grew up in black exportation films. Um, what I, I didn't show, I was going to show this other found footage film, but the thing I like, I like when films make mistakes. And I have a whole series of black exportation trailers where they're awfully put together, but I love them. Because, because, because they're, they're, you know, scenes are missing, frames are missing. So I like the formal quality of what, and then I remember, I just, I make films like that. Like I make, because then, you know, that calls in questions, though, what the materiality of what it is. Like, that's the content. Like, because it is what, 
no materiality, but mostly like black exploitation films are more are inspir- half of you know there some of them are bad, some of them are good but, you know, i just I just like the kind of language, so to speak, yeah, 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 yeah. Anybody uh, else? Oh, oh, oh. Kevin, yeah. thank you so very much i I want to go back to the issue of materiality. Oh, what? Oh, what? Materiality, oh, yeah. but focusing on the relationship between objects and time. Yeah, um, yeah. you Dirty have time. given us a lot of ideas about the objects that you use, from the film camera to objects that you film, like cars and so on, yeah. and the changes in time. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you showed us the objects that you produce as sculptures, mm-hmm. for example, the irons that are rubber, yeah. I frankly expected it to kind of disintegrate, to change in time as well. Um, but you used a material that was stable. Yeah. And I wonder whether you can talk a bit about it. Absolutely, Because yeah. that's more useless objects in some ways, yeah. pretending to be functional, rather than objects that disappear or change in time. Yeah, well, I want things to last. I mean, you know, like if you're working in the Opal factory, that car's got to last. I mean, you're thinking about not, I mean, you shouldn't be thinking about, well, the management is thinking about parts and labor or something like that. But but as a worker, I mean, my cousins would talk about, like that they'd be upset that I wouldn't buy a General Motors car, you know. Because they built that thing to last. And then so when I'm making things, I want it to to be and, and you know, and and then so like here's an ad, um years ago I was uh but anyway, but just when I was like twenty I was making art in art school and making all these big nasty things with blood on it, handmade paper, jizz, all, you know, just macho bullshit art stuff. And so my mom and dad would come to the show and like, oh, that's nice. You know, they'd be like, yeah, what's going on? But, you know, but, but, but then so I had to realize that, oh, okay, that's not going to cut it. So what's going to cut it is craft, you know. So for me, I started making things. So I've been started to, like, increasing, making things that look like, as if they're going to laugh, you know, like people respect that. Oh, that's well, I, you know, just like I had those end tables there and my uncle's and me like didn't care about the fo- po- you know, photograph, but like this thing is going to last. That's well made. So then that's the kind of content, you know, not just things are, 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 are you know, things made the over time, but that's not the strategy that I'm going for. Yeah. Kevin, but yeah. there is a sort of dialectic because on the one hand, you want things to last. Yeah. The car should last. On the other hand, you crash cars. Well, yeah, because because there was a well, yeah, but that car is still lasting because that car is not functioning, and then so they're just stamping, you know. So I'm just re so I'm just restamping that car, you know, you know. So so I mean that's just that's just not going away. There's no, way, I mean it's like it's not biodegradable. <laughs> you know, they're gonna bury it and it's gonna like. Worms or I don't know whatever that kind of thing, but anyway, you know. So anyway, so that's the kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it changes form, but it won't go away, so to speak. That's a kind of a longer answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, oh. See, look, I like the fellows because <laughs> we don't play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Kevin, that was yeah. great. Um, so I have a question about, um, I guess, the relationship between your work that focuses on the. School Sculptural yeah. and on form and on the made, mm-hmm. which was there was just a, yeah. some discussion of, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, your fascination with and dedication to, kind of showing embedded, ordinary, human, absolutely, yeah, 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 you yeah. know, action, conversation, labor, yeah, but in a way that you don't want to explain ever i mean i do but i'm yeah go ahead well i mean i was just struck by some of the things you said about you know the the knowledge is on the screen yeah the well i don't care about the audience but to the extent that the audience is watching (laughs) they don't know nothing you know whatever they or they're not going to be spoon-fed anything about like what the heck was that thing in the bowling alley a factory, yeah, that yeah. big circular <laughs> steel. What the yeah. heck was that? Anyway, okay. Yeah. So, um, or, you know, I saw your wonderful film at the Berlinale, mm-hmm. and if you don't know anything, you're sitting there for the first few minutes going, what is this? 
Yeah. You know, is this yeah. pilot training? Yeah, I yeah. think it might be pilot training, you know. Hmm. So um, I'm just curious about the, you know, because that's such a kind of like distinctive aspect of what you're interested yeah. in. And yeah. if you could like reflect out loud. A yeah, bit. yeah. Oh, yeah. To, yeah. For me, f you know, formalism, that gets me up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it like keeps me up, but <laughs> but no. But for me, yeah. For me, it's a formal. For me to, to get me to make the thing, like I'm looking at all the formal possibilities, so to speak, and and how I can improve on that, like that. But but there is like the kind of social political thing that's going on because everybody up there is African of of African descent because I've shot films in Brazzaville and and London and and in Italy. And in the fact that, um, because they have a different his set of histories than, you know, than, you know, with other Americans. I mean, Consulate Park. I mean, I mean, we're de I mean, we're denied to vote. You know, you know, and still, it still is. You know, you know, like, like, like that kind of thing. But look who's making democracy happen. Because we believe in the council, you know. So then, so that whole idea of like, you know, all. Although I'm talking about the Flickr film. But 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 there was a black woman there who was just like, yeah, I you know, to, but today's my day, you know, kind of thing. So you know, so that's always going to be there. And I had a better answer. Hold on, no, you answered. No, you asked something else too. Um, oh man, you asked something. I had a there's some formal something histories. There's something else you asked. You said. Yeah, I had a better answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just like like again. I, there's something about well, for me, the subject matter like what they like that they can do what they do without them explaining it, so to speak. And so I and so even I have to catch up. Even when I'm filming, I got to figure out where to stand where this is going to look interesting, you know, so to speak. So I got to learn there. And I was like, no, bro, just or, you know, just whatever, just do what you do, and then you, I'll follow you. So like. You know, so my whole thing, so it just, when I'm filming things, I look for the action. So, and even when I have scripted dialogue, um, I don't do any blocking, you know. I just, like, I tell my man, I, I tell my friends, like, I'll find the action, and I'll try to get it from from there. But, man, I had a, I, I, I swear I had a better answer. I forgot what it was. God darn it. Oh, man, I forgot. I, oh, man, it, like, I'll come to Yeah, I'll come. I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Damn it, I forgot. I'm just curious, you film your family members quite a lot. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. you spoke yeah. about them quite a lot, quite yeah, yeah. eloquently. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about that and your thinking behind that? They're available. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it totally helps that my cousin's a snowplow truck driver, so, so like, um, it gives me muscle there. Um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to get into General Motors factory, but I couldn't. And then, like, I just remember Sadie and Daisy had just retired on Friday. Um, so I thought that was a milestone. They're 55 years old, and they retired. They worked 30 years in the plant. Um, uh, yeah, just, I mean, uh, I mean, again, there's, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking for people who look like me, so that helps. Um, <laughs> so, you know, because I, well, because when I'm looking through the viewfinder, I'm looking at the history. You know, and again, the film, um, I think when, the, I think I showed a, like a still from Sound That and FE26, I just like, I broke my foot that summer and then my students were helping me film and they did a fantastic job and they hooked me up. But I realized a lot of the film is made through the viewfinder and I didn't look through the viewfinder that summer. It took me forever to cut those films. And then, so when I'm looking to do uh, the, the, through the viewfinder, I know what's happening next. And then I know that this, like, this young man is the same age as my son. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm like stalking this kid. Because I know that he has a future, and then he had a past, but he mostly has, but mostly has a future. And he has a presence. He has a presence that will lead to a future. So I'm hoping that, again, the long take, and then what you were asking to as well, it's just that these things kind of come out. So when the shot is over, there is a future. You know, there is something, you know. Like, we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, George Clinton said, we were already here, and we was waiting on y'all. So, and, and and then, so they're waiting on y'all. You know, we're waiting on y'all. So then, so that's what I'm looking, and, and so then, so then, so when I'm looking for the, like, in the viewfinder, that's got to come out. And sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I shot at the Air Force Base, nothing happened. And because I didn't see that, you know. And that's my fault. 
Um, I didn't frame it up. I didn't, you know, my vantage points were or something, you know, you know, I just learned whatever. But then, like, that's a lot of it to you know, too as well. Because I not, not, because not only see a backstory, like, so I do see like that paint can, you know, there's a backstory stuff. But also, I more importantly see a future story, like where is this going to go, and then and then so that leads kind of socially and economically too as well, too as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, right there. Yeah. I don't know how much time we got. Yeah. I, I, I still got a better answer. <laughs> I forgot. I, yeah. Um, I would just be interested in which organizations fund uh, the making of your films and how easy or difficult uh, is it in the current political climate to obtain funding for your films? Um, my right pocket. Um, the fun, yeah, that kind of thing. You know. um, there's not a lot of. I mean, it depends on what state you live in in the United States, but the southern states, there's not a lot of art grant money. Um, I teach, too, so I use that. And then uh, and I'm like, and I'm not trying to be rich. I'm trying to be a thousandaire, you know, <laughs> whatever. You know, you know thousandaire is my goal. But, uh, you know, but uh, I, uh, I, hope, I hope that translates into German. But, uh, but anyway, but I mean, I just have work, fun, new work. Some another like work or with fun NEA new work. A or any organization. Nah, like that, I mean, I mean, I had the last rounds of NEA grant was nineteen ninety five. I was the last person to get that. Um, I was in the state of Ohio. Did, lived here too long, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's um, yeah. I mean, there's more private institutions than there are state. Um, you know, America just doesn't believe in its arts, but arts make more. I remember I was on these like. Cause I lived in Cleveland for like six years. I was on these, all these, trying to get the mayor to like, look, if you give an artist five thousand dollars, he or she is going to go to the artist, to the art supply store, the hardware store, and people are going to come to the opening. They're going to come, and they're going out to dinner. They're getting drinks. It's so much money, and you know that kind of that kind of economic condition that we were kind of fighting for. You know, like back in the day, but people don't believe in um, the way they were to build sports stadiums that never fill. Um, you know, so that was the thing that was going on in Cleveland. I don't know about but by, by, by most cities, but uh, um, shit, I'm getting old, man. I, um, you know, there was a huge grant that was due last week, Creative Capital. I mean, I must have, I don't know how many folks I'm on their list for to write for them for that, you know, so there's not a lot of financial support for art um and then thus you see the same people making the same thing you get to see, you know so you see the same backgrounds making the same thing all the time like you know that's you know that's just it because it's stuff's it's stuff's not cheap um you know so um i wish you know it's funny you know, like, i think this when i'm around adults i'm pessimistic but, but just when i'm around 20 year olds i'm optimistic because of the future you know so to speak so but, um, but, shit, I don't know. I mean, you know, I was hoping that Obama would create a, you know, cultural minister. And I think he was on his way to that, too. But it just didn't stick. Yeah, it didn't stick. So we don't have that kind of. I mean, you, you, like, uh, you stuff that happens in Canada, um, the Canadian Film Board and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's something like Sundance does that. You know, that's what something state should be doing. But those are private institutions. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. More. The fellas. Yeah. yeah. Let's <laughs> give a shout out to the fellas. Always. I just, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for this. I missed the Berlin Alley, but I mm. will go to the Babylon. Mm. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about labor. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, it is true that family comes a lot in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. your speech and in yeah. your films. Uh, but there is a, there is a um, uh, subtext going through oh, yeah, your totally, speech yeah, and yeah. your film that concerns process of labor, even when you say that you're going to show the process of making a film, or yeah. even when you show us how you make an object or, or the objects that you make, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So can you develop a little bit more? Is this an obsession of yours? Is, oh, is total it, obsession. You know, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like, um, again, I grew up in this, and for me it's the, you know, grew up in this working class town. Oh, I know the answer was, it was mostly the, the Lorena Hansberry play where it's just, they said you know all this it's this whole idea of just staying stagnant of and then for me it's uh, hold on i'll get back to it. so like it's the whole idea of not failing but not succeeding too 
So formally, that's the kind of, and then you, I see that every day is like, you know, paycheck to paycheck. So, so we had to say in the United States that you live paycheck to paycheck, so to speak. And then, so that's how I see kind of labor growing up. I mean, of course, I'm in a different, I don't know, different kind of arena now. I mean, you know, but then you know, my family think I'm a school teacher, you know, I'm a professor. Oh, you teach school. That's true. <laughs> you know, so I'm a school, and actually we have a history of school teacher. My great aunt Maddie, at 13 in 2000 and in, in 1901, any black girl who showed intelligence, they had to teach. And when you have to teach, you can't have kids because you can't show carnal activity. So she had to go to school every summer to get her degree. So, so the whole idea of that labor, you know. The kind of physicality, not physicality, not sexual, not everything, and then, then the body, and then, and then so for me, it's more about the kind of body. It's just like, like, like the kind of you know, like the whole idea of um, like at in the Park Lanes, and Park Lanes is an eight-hour film based on the mythical eight-hour workday, which is a, a true thing. But in the South, factories are open ten hours, four days a week because it's cheaper. So that factory. That cubica was open ten hours a day, so that's why we're only only for three days. And so at the end of it, they can't wait till Thursday, you know. And then and then like they say that, and then like in the like in the film, because Thursdays are Friday, so to speak. So because their body, you know, they know you know something that their body they need that rest. So for me, it's more the kind of physicality. And so for me, I do want to show. I remember we made this uh, film called Fifeville in Charlottesville, and I wanted to shoot on Friday because I wanted to get that body. I, like, I wanted to show that body, like, tired. And, and even I made a guy walk up and down a hill and shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was brutal. And I was like, we got to get... And then, so I felt bad, so we just walked down the hill. <laughs> and I'm walking backwards with a camera. So, you know, so, you know, so, but then, so for me, it's more like how the body changes and stuff. And, and then for good or bad, I mean, I used to live in, I like, I went to undergraduate school at the University of Akron. And then, then that was the tire factory. It was like, oh, what, what the world, and I go home, I smell like rubber. My mom would hate when I come home. I just, she, I couldn't get it off of me. But then once you couldn't smell that, then nobody was working. So, you know, and then, so the, so then, so it's not good for you, but it's good for you, you know, in a weird way, you know, so that, so that kind of maintaining that, you know, that kind of, you know, because the reason why I showed that image of me in, from 1970 is, oh, it's funny and I'm super cute, <laughs> you know, and I'm like making art, whatever. And, but, but, but for me, it's busing because my block was bused to a white school. You, you, you know, and that picture's not true, you know, that kind of thing. So then, like, it's always the kind of up and down, you know. It's like, oh, it's funny, but it's not. It's tragic, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, that yeah, kind of thing, yeah. So, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it works here. All right, sweet. Well, thanks for coming. Oh, my God.